What is up, everybody? It is Alex from Heavy New York calling from Zoom again. And this time we are here with the almighty dope. Thank you so much, Edsel, for being here today. How you doing, buddy? Thanks for having me. I appreciate you. Anytime, anytime, man. It's great to have you here. Blood Money Part Zero is coming out. So we'll get the silly question out of the way first. Is Blood Money Part Zero the sequel to Blood Money or the prequel to Blood Money? I would I would call it both, actually. Um, but but it's obviously being called part zero, it's a prequel. But I would say a good bit of the material was written during the same time. Some of it was written prior, and there were a few songs that were written currently. So um, it's a prequel with a little bit of both. <laughs> well, to, because uh, I've seen a lot of like EPs or albums that do kind of have like these uh, part ones and parts two to it. For a listener to get the full context of Blood Money, should they listen to uh, Blood Money Part One before they go into Blood Money Part Zero? Or if this happens to be a listener's first album, it's not going to make a difference. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it makes a difference. Um, it's not a concept album in that regard. It's just more that I had so much material written in a similar time frame that it felt appropriate to call it, that to put them under the blood money moniker. Um, so that, you know, that's all kind of from the same time. Like, to be honest, my, my goal is that this will be the last full length album that I do because I feel like part of the, like me being completely self-contained, meaning that I'm the, I'm, I'm in the, I'm the creative director, I'm the producer, I'm the mixer, um, also the label. There's no, like, there's no imposed deadline on other than my own. So I have so much unfinished music. It's really hard for me to get to the finish on a large body of work. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, creativity to me is something like, I don't like putting time on. So I could have, I could go into my, to a hard drive and I could find a stall that I could go, man, check this out. Here's, it's, you know, it's recorded well, it's produced well but it's missing a bridge. And it's a song that I started recording in 2006. And you'll be like, wow, this is a cool song. That's all I know, but until I finish the bridge, I can't put it out, I can't finish it. So that kind of shit sits around sometimes for years and years and years, and then maybe next year I'll pull it up, and all of a sudden I'll hear the idea and I'll sing it, and I'll go, fine, the song is done, put it out. Yeah. Um, so having that take place for 12 songs is, much more of a milestone for me than maybe it is for a lot of other people. So once this album finally comes out, we're putting it out, you know, we're putting tracks out every final track put out. Uh, my hope is that I'll just turn it to like a single model. So I'll just put out songs when I'm when they're done. I feel like especially because I'm not putting out music for a fee anymore. Like I'm giving away the digital and do it for free um there's no reason to hold them to put them into a larger collection so i just want to start releasing music as as i feel like it's done and as i want to um but i felt a responsibility to blood money blood money part zero to completing a full body of work for two reasons one so much of that material that's on this release started around the time frame but also because it had been so long since i released anything that i felt like it would sort of be a letdown to just put out a song or two to like get something more waiting and then mm -hmm. so but now that we you know once we get this out of the way i'm hoping that we get into 2023 and by the end of 2023 i'm putting out more music yeah. in 2024 i can put out more music as opposed to having to wait for a big epic timeline for me to put another well song. You know, it's funny too that you mentioned that you kind of go back into this earlier material, especially because life turned 20 years old last year and group therapy is gonna be 20, year old, 20 years old next year. When you dig up this old material to release, does it almost put you back in that feeling when you wrote it however many years ago? Or do you kind of like approach it with like a, with a modern day uh, version of who you personally are it just depends on how refined the idea is when i get back to it like if, if it's a song that i started writing you know super super long ago and it's mostly complete 
then my intention will be to just fill in the gaps that are incomplete and let it be what it was. Um, but if it's, you know, maybe just a, a very rough demo and just a piece of something that I really liked and, and now I'm, I'm sort of starting over with it, then it will sound more mm -hmm. Because it's, it's funny too, when you compare like life to group therapy, to blood money or any of those, it almost seems like there are is a significant way like every album kind of spe uh, speaks to itself you could tell what song would be off of what album do you think of a listener do you think when you release these new singles a listener's going to be able to hear and be like okay that was recorded during the life era that was recorded during the group therapy era um i i don't know and and, and for this particular release though nothing really goes back farther than blood money so um I was just using, I was just giving you an example earlier of uh, of how I have material you know for all time frames of my life up there just wasn't um, but I, I don't know it's hard for me to answer that also because I feel like this band has always or at least after the first album like starting with the life record um, I was very uh, hent on not allowing the band to be in a box. Um, you know, even though I guess we're a new metal band from that era, um, you know, there were, you know, a take on album like Life, where you have a song like Die, Motherfucker, Die, which is one of the heaviest songs we've ever done and one of our most uh, iconic tracks. But there's also, you know, with or without you on that same record, which has a piano intro and it, you know, doesn't have a screen in the entire song. Um, and then group therapy, we went even farther when we had a song called Burn that was even heavier than Die Motherfucker Die, but then we had a song called Sing, we had a song called Easy, we had an acoustic. Um, so I've just, it's just always been important to me to not allow any overarching classification for dope. That's why, like, you know, the latest single that we put out is a song called Believe and uh, on Blood Money Part One, we had a song called Hold On. And um, people that are just there to check out the music, you know, they either like it or they don't. But then there, there always seems to be this very, very small percentage of people that maybe aren't actually dope fans that maybe just caught on to the song, like I'm gonna fucking die or whatever, in their head they've categorized dope as being this like industrial metal band. That's all we do. And they would hear a song like believe or a song like hold on to what is this shit? This is a dope. And it's like, you're going to tell me what dope. Like that's a little arrogant. Like, yeah. um, so it's just always been important for, for me to feel like the band can kind of do anything at once and you're never going to please everybody. And, you know, if you're a person that just wants to, to be that industrial metal band, well, that's fine. Just understand you can go to Spotify and of the hundred songs that the band has put out over the last 20 years, you can easily find enough to make yourself a really cool industrial metal dope playlist. Yeah, 100%. Um, like, my, know, like I, mine is a terrible thing to taste level. Like, uh, yeah, like, do, do I need to make an, an album with 13 of those on it? I don't think I do. Like I would rather make a very wide stretching record and then you grab what you like for the that you're in and make your own playlist and you know, let it be that. So for that, I feel like the band, you know, is a bit harder to define. Um, I think overarchingly people have probably defined us as more of like a new metal industrial metal band, which is fine. Um, but uh but I was just sort of answering your question as far as where things fit, which songs come from which album. Like, I don't know if, if I really connect with it like that, but, but maybe maybe fans do. You know, yep. you guys are, you feel it from a different perspective than I do, so. Yeah, 100%. You have a very dedicated oh. fan base. I wanted to talk a little bit about your lyrical works, too, because I feel like you touched upon many different lyrical subject matters, whether it be Burn or Die, Motherfucker, Die. Like, I feel like you, you, you know. Very positive songs there, those two. I mean, Hey, you know, you know what? It doesn't matter if it's positive or negative. It's real, and that's what matters. Um, Fair enough. But do you always need to hear the music before you come up with lyrics, or has there ever been a time where a certain subject matter maybe influenced the song itself? 
Um, I'm not really a lyric guy, like a poetry guy. Like I don't really sit down with a pad and write lyrics. Um, I'm I'm more of a. This is gonna sound stupid, but I'm more of a hook guy. That's not stupid um, at all. Max Cavalera said the same thing. Yeah, like I start everything from a hook. So and and oftentimes the the lyrical content is restricted by the amount of syllables that I'm able to put into the hook. So, you know, if the hook is whatever the hook is, I have to fit my thought into whatever I have deemed to be the hook. And and I generally write all my parts that way. Like my and I generally start with a chorus, you know, that you kind of find, you know, the biggest part of the song and go, all right, this is worth my time or work backwards. Um, but even my, my burst delivery, um, I feel like everything sort of like, I used to call them heavy metal nursery rhymes because some of it is so simplistic and stupid, but it's just really like die motherfucker die is the epitome of a heavy metal nursery rhyme. Heavy burn the epitome of a heavy metal nursery. Rhyme. <laughs> um, so, uh, but it's not all like that, but the formula of how I write generally fits into that sort of hooky heavy metal nursery rhyme concept where I'm fitting my thought into a certain amount of syllables, usually with one or two words that have to find like, all right, I like the way this sounds. Like I'll give you an example. Uh, if you're familiar with one of my favorite dope songs ever, it's called violence. Oh, hell yeah. Uh, so the hook of violence was, I want your violence motherfucker. Show me your violence. That became the chorus. Well, when I first wrote that, it was, I want your violence. Show my dub, a show my no violence. It was just I just said syllables into the mic that gave me all right. That's my hook. I know that that rhythm works with the word violent. Now what is show my no my show my no gonna be replaced with? It? And I'll sit there in agony going all right da 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 da. And then I just ended up with motherfucker show me your, which is so simple and perfect heavy metal nursery rhyme. But in any other song that's generally the way i'm writing i'm like i'll i'll be i'll be stuck with two or three words that i feel like define the hook and then a rhythm maybe even a rhyme and then i'm trying to cram those however many words i can fit into those syllables to complete the thought mm -hmm. which I think it's very opposite from the way a lot of people write. Not at all. Um, Not at all. Really? I yeah. I mean, like I, yeah. I've, I've said to artists before, and I, I, I've repeated this joke so many times, like saying, have you ever had the best lyrics ever? But then they're always one syllable over like every arrangement that you have. And oh, yeah. It is. But then you have guys like Corey Taylor who are just so fucking prolific that they figure out a way to make that extra syllable take the line longer. And it's just like, okay, that guy's playing in a whole different fucking beat. But the words, the words don't change though. Like the word itself didn't change the amount of syllables. I think that's within the song structure that they have to adjust. Yeah, I don't know. There's some guys though. I feel like it just reinvented. Like Eminem's another one where like you think he's gonna phrase it in the, the way he did the line before, and he just takes it somewhere else, and you go like, it's even better. So like, I've never found myself to be that prolific. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a little more constricted but i do the best i can and it works for me um but yeah I, i'm not a i'm not a a poetry guy i don't sit down and write words and then pull from them. i wish i could more because i feel like i could tell some some deeper stories but i know it works for me yeah i mean every artist is their own person it's not it's not just the art that defines us it's the process as well but in order to yeah. get that creative inspiration that drive that creative energy do you almost have to like put yourself in a certain place or have to be in a certain mood in order for that to happen or does inspiration just like strike when you least expect it it's hard to say um i smoke a lot of weed when i'm writing i don't know if that's to dumb my brain down or what but um i don't know I, I think it just depends on the subject matter but again because i i generally find myself in these little tiny pieces i'm trying to fill it's more it's it's more um more it's less about inspiration and more about finding a solution it's almost map tetris it's finding a solution that i that i'm willing to live with um, I, and I don't feel like I have the highest standards for that. I just needed to feel like it was real and 
that like it works within the confines of what you know the pattern i've built and the hook that i've built and man if i can just get it then i'm like great it's done and i can move on but sometimes that's the hardest thing in the world to fill that little gap um i find that i struggle more on verses even because i feel like i'm supposed to tell more of the story in the verses whereas i just want to write the hook and just repeat the hook um and i and you'll notice i will do that a lot in verses even where i'll repeat part of the hook so like a song like now or never both of the verses start with what you go and do that for because it's like that's a hook i'm going to repeat that hook because that you remember it and I like songs that like you can hear them two or three times and you're already singing along to multiple parts of the song. Uh, it might be a little old school. I have noticed that a lot of a lot of the stuff that really works now is a bit more intricate because you'll get bored of it quickly. Um, I feel like as I write with that mentality, my stuff might be a little bit more, for lack of better words, disposable. Not not you know, stand the test of a thousand listens where other stuff that's like so intricate has all these different time changes and all this cool stuff. Um, it may not get you the first time, but that's part of the reason that people really like this stuff over and over. But, uh, but I, I can't, I can't stretch too far out of what's comfortable for me or it just feels like I'm faking it. Mm -hmm. So, well, it, it's funny you mention that, too, because being that dope originated here in New York City, you know, um, it's funny because people always think, oh, you're if you told people who didn't know your music, oh, uh, my band is dope. We're from New York City. They'll probably assume that you're a hardcore band. I kind of wanted to or rap. <laughs> Fair enough. But like, what was like the sort of scene like when when dope was formulating in a way? Like, were you kind of like evolved in the hardcore scene? Were you hanging out with Tommy uh -huh. Victor as he did sound at CBGB's? No, dude, I was like a, I was a totally different animal. Like I, um, I came to New York with a purpose and I was very strategic in what I was doing. Um, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale and I watched bands get signed out of Fort Lauderdale and there were only a couple to do it. And it took so long. And because I was, uh, inquisitive I asked a lot of questions and I, I just always uh, had a bit of a business savvy to me a bit of a marketing savvy to me I came to learn the process how bands get signed which you know is not a big mystery but back then there was no internet like you just, nobody knew you had to ask questions and figure it out but what I came to realize is that okay you you play shows somebody eventually tells somebody, hey, this band is selling a lot of tickets and your demo gets in the hands either through the mail or through, a, you know, a trusted person it ends up in the hands of some low level person at a record company. This is back record. That low level person begins investigating the band. A year later, the band has enough going on to where maybe that low level record company person gets approval for them to get on a plane and go see the band they go and report back six months later their boss maybe gets on a plane to go down and see the band and so a band can you know quite often back in the day would take you two or three years before anybody with any power was actually coming to see the band to make a decision as to whether or not this band could start being considered to be done that to me just made no sense in the world I thought, all right, I'm going to put all of my stuff together, meaning my promotional materials, my, my recordings, everything I'm going to do, I'm going to do it behind the scenes. Like other bands are playing bars to 50 people. I'm going, fuck all that. I'm not doing that. I'm going to build it all behind closed doors. And then I'm going to book a show and I'm going to promote my band like I already have a record company. So me and my brother at the time who was in my band was part of the reason that we chose the word dope um we were inspired from a business standpoint from like nwa how they were self-contained they generated revenue through questionable measures and they invested that revenue into the marketing promotion of their band so we took our money uh and we made a shitload of little orange cassette tapes it was a six song demo and we just flooded new york city with these cassette tapes the same way that a, a major label would because 
major labels promote by just, you know, uh, going into debt. Like that's how it works. Like they promote a band and then they hope that they're going to sell records to recoup the debt they promoting the band. We looked at it the same way. We're going to spend our own money to go into debt and then hopefully we get a record deal and then we can pay back the debt that we've incurred to ourselves to promote our band. So we booked our first show. Um, I made a, you know, I made a deal with a dude who I knew, um, and we promoted that show for about six months with these orange cassette tapes and these flyers and we sold the first show out. We weren't part of the scene. We built our own scene by, um, you know, like I said, not playing by the rules. Like I remember being in New York City, like going and meeting with somebody at Coney Island High or CBG. And they're like, okay, well, if you want to play here, you're playing a Tuesday night and you go on at 8 p.m. and there'll be five other bands and you got to sell 50 tickets. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, I'm going to sell this place out. We're like, oh, sure you are, kid. Like, everybody was just so skeptical of a band that actually had a vision to go do the work and put their own asses in beats. Like, the CBGB's model and the Coney Island High model was the model of, like, we're using the club for the club's draw. I didn't see the club being the draw. I saw the band being the draw. And I had to prove that, which is understandable. So that's what we did. And, and my goal was to come to New York City where all the labels were already at. So that when I sold that first show out, the next time I played, there would be labels at my show instead of having to wait two years. So I had a record deal. It, my, my, my goal was if I didn't have a record deal by 10 shows, it wasn't going to work. So we had a deal after two shows. And it's exactly what I thought would happen. Um, that is so cool. But no, that is yeah, so we were cool. part of no scene. We built our own scene and and, uh, and did it with self promotion and uh, self belief. That's incredible, and I really think you should. I mean, this is going to be the cheesiest joke you probably have ever heard in your life, but it's like DIY, motherfucker, DIY. Totally. Yep. Totally. Hundred percent. I mean, from day one, this band has been that that mantra, and then we signed to a major label, and you know that was really beneficial for us in the in the first album but a lot of people don't realize that our second album may as well not even have been on a major label because we were we were we had the rug pulled out from underneath us before that album came out and a lot of it was my own ignorance and my own just you know not understanding like we were signed to heavy right? which ultimately is its own. and our first album did very well and they were super supportive of it and I went in the studio and I made the second album and I was really uh, headstrong on, on wanting to push uh, Die Motherfucker Die to the underground and just push that out there as like the follow up to everything you knew about Dope on album one. We're going to push this Die Motherfucker Die song down your throat. And there was a, a lot of uh, a lot of the, the, the stuff within the artwork was a bit you know, politically correct for lack of and the label was cool with everything until the World Trade Center. And when that happened, they were like, whoa, dude, we're Sony Music and we like you guys, but you're going to have to like play ball here. The new metal and movement I, got fucked harder than any other genre. Bodies by well, Drowning Pool was pulled yeah. off. Click Click Boom by Saliva was pulled off. So, But, but, let's, but let's understand that those bands as much as they got fucked those thong got six months of the ride before they got pulled so like no one questions that click click boom or or bodies were hits yeah. like they 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 went to like top 10 on the charts first off die motherfucker die was never going to be a hit it was never intended to go on the radio but our our because we had come out in 99 and 2000 life came after like a year after those two artists that you're that you're mentioning so um so when the world trade center fell they came to me and were like we we need you to like reconsider some things and in retrospect i probably could have reconsidered some things and made some adjustments to like respect the fact that they were a sony company and that they had to like you know look at things a bit differently um I don't know how that would have looked, but I was too immature at the time to even have the conversation. And I was just like, what are you talking about? 
fuck you, this is my record. And if you look at the artwork of the life record, censored bars all over the record. Because I told them, anything you don't like, put a censored bar on it. I'm not changing anything. Like, I was not cooperative at all. So, um, really, before that album ever came out, we were dropped from Epic Records. Like, if, if you look at the touring cycle for the first album, we toured with Flipknot, Full Chain, Static X, Seven Dust, Orgy, Kid Rock, like, headlined our own tour. Like, we toured with everyone. Alice Cooper, second album, we did one tour. And we were done. We had no tour support. We had nothing. Um, so we became an independent band far sooner than most people know, and far sooner than than most bands that lived. Because if you got dropped from a major label in 2000, 2001, 2002, like it was over. Like go back and look at how many of those bands got dropped and they were never heard from again, or they just spiraled the fucking drain, and that was it. Like and and not knocking them is fucking hard but this band became independent and went back to our diy spirit that got us a record deal in the first place and just went okay well i'm not going to let that happen to me again i'm not going to be reliant on the team and record for my career to either have momentum or not because when we got dropped from epic dude it was like every you're just abandoned on every level like radio stations don't return your calls anymore booking agents don't return your call like you just nothing they can look at you like damaged goods so we had to really rebuild the band and and the biggest testament to dope's longevity dope's career is um the group therapy album was a very very hard time and that was our first fully independent album um and that was an album that was very hard to get people to listen to for a lot of the reasons that I just described. Like, you were dropped from a major label two years ago. You're damn it good. No one cares. So we worked that album and then set up American Apathy with my old school mentality for almost three years. And in the, at the end of the day, long story short here, we sold more copies of American Apathy than we sold of Life, which was Life was on Epic Records and American Apathy was an independent release. So that was really the point where Dope reestablished itself. And if you if you really want to say, like, you know, you can go, oh, they were on a big label back in 1999 and they had all these tours. Well, that's true. But the band would have been dead if I hadn't had the mentality that I had to build it back to the level to American Apathy, which was really almost like our debut album again, and put the band back on the map and our phone call started getting returned again started playing bigger shows again we started touring with other bands again we weren't on this island of just like there we, we refer to the times during group therapy as the dark days because it was so dark it was so depressing because we were forgotten like there were some fans there still but again when the, when the major label hype goes away there was no social media reaching those fans became impossible without the machine that was plugged in for us previously from epic records that got us to the record stores for in store for that to to sort of break out to the community that would find shows when all of those threads are taken from you how do you find your fans even? like there's no social media there's no instagram there's no facebook there's no myspace there's nothing so we were just completely we had no ability to reach our fans anymore for literally two or three or four years until we built it back, almost built a new fan base. And then once that got big enough on American Apathy, I think a bunch of people just found us again. And that allowed the band to sort of reset and ultimately looking like a snowball, you know, allowed us to rebuild to where now, you know, the band is, is reestablished and has a 25 year career. But it was, in, it was, if I, I'd be lying to you if I told you it wasn't a serious effort. I mean, long forgotten. Everything happens for a reason, and I think that's the great way to sum up dope. People still love you. You guys killed it on that last Static X tour I saw back in 2019. So that was fun tour. Yep. So you know, it's uh, always exciting to see dope. I want to thank you so much for your uh, time today. Uh, We're sadly out of time, uh, but uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. My my answer. I told you my answers are long winded because I'm I'm not practiced. So. 
Uh, we'll do this again sometime. I'll, I'll get to more of your questions. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know what? The longer the answers, the better. So uh, thank you Fair so enough. much. Everybody, we are here with Dope. Be sure to check out Blood Money Part Zero. We'll see you next time on Heavy New York.